for the evolve function, we are supposed to directly edit the cell's parameter. But yes, could I not make a new list for the next gen and then return it instead? Well, you could, except that's not the way the um, function, uh, that's not the way the contract for the function is written. Um, so uh, the, the, it is a, there, there is a, I mean, you could, um, someone who had written the contract for Evolve could have said that it returns a new list. Um, but um, as an exercise, I want you to be able to uh, be able to copy um, a list or copy a list of lists correctly. Right. So that's why I'm forcing you to edit the um, parameter uh, directly. Right. Because to edit the past in list or past in list of lists, uh, you need to make a copy of it first. Um, so that uh, you can correctly compute whether a cell stays alive or dies. Right. Uh, but yes, if you were designing this yourself, you could have chosen to uh, have done it the other way. Could I just uh, expand on that question there? Um, yeah. What if at the end of, uh, so for example, what I did was what made sense to me was to create a an empty list and then populate that list with ele elements that were referencing the original cells list. And then at the end, I take my kind of um, my new list and then redefine cells in terms of that new list. Oh yeah, you can do that too. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That, that, that would be the old, yeah. So you could, um, you could make a new list and then uh, take the new list, the contents of the new list and dump them into the original list. Yeah, that's fine. That's right. Yeah. Okay, thank you. That's fine. Um, depending on how you do that, that might be slightly less efficient, but it's not, a, it's not important for this assignment. Can we use the Python's inbuilt copy module for creating the temp list? Yes, if uh, there is a standard library function that does something you need, you may use it. Um, you should avoid using third party stuff though. So basically, um, you don't want the TA to have to install software to mark your assignment. Right. So if it's a part of this Python standard library, go ahead and use it. I'm, I'm fine with that. OK, any other questions? Super. Oh, one more. OK, that's good. Um, all right, so I guess today, so um, in the course, this is the point where we actually start into uh, where it becomes, um, where it starts to transition from a programming course which is largely what the first six weeks of the course had been uh, to a computing science course. Um, and so the, uh, I guess the technique we're looking at now uh, or this week, um, and we'll be looking at it again um, in later weeks, um, is something called recursion. Uh, there was a notebook posted uh, yesterday um, that you can look at that has more examples, uh, has a lot more examples for you to look at. Uh, the textbook has examples too, but they're unusual. Uh, they're a bit odd, they are examples. Um, the examples they use, so the textbook tries to make them uh, re like uh, relatable to, re uh, excuse me, relatable to real world examples. Um, but that makes it, uh, uh, makes it a little harder to understand the recursion because now you have to understand the problem that they're trying to solve. So the textbook uses simpler examples, uh, ones that you should all be familiar with. Um, and solves those using recursion. Um, so I'm going to actually use one of the textbook examples to explain exactly what happens um, in recursion. Okay, so I want to. We're going to start out by I want to uh, by implementing a function uh, that prints out n copies of a string all on one line. Right? And so I think you all know how to do this, right? If you if I ask you to write a function to do this, you would just write a loop, right? And in your loop, uh, you would loop. Uh, probably using a uh, uh, i in range, right? And your range would probably from, be from zero to n. Right? And your loop body is simply print s, right? Print the string and make sure you don't go to the next line, right? So you need n equals um, the empty string, right? And if you run that, it'll it'll work exactly the way you'd expect it to. Right? And now that's the uh, obvious way of writing it, um, and it's the way pretty much any programmer would write it um, uh, if they're asked to do so, right? Uh, but there's another way you can think of writing this uh, function, right? So uh, the alternative way, which is a little longer, uh, but does not seem to involve a loop, um, is to write it like so, right? Uh, and so you can reason out that if 
uh, you're asked to print a string less than once, then you don't have to do anything, right? So if someone asks you to print a string zero times, there's nothing to do, right? So if n is less than one, you're done, right? There's nothing to do. Um, otherwise, uh, so if n is um, one or larger, uh, you can print the string once, right? So that gets you part way to the solution, right? Uh, and then after you've printed it once, you're left with the problem where you have to print the string uh, n minus one more times, right? So if you print it once and then you print it n minus one more times, well, n minus one plus one is n. And so that ends up, that ends up printing the string n times. And you can actually encapsulate that all in a function that looks like this. So if n is less than one, so if n is less than one, right, do nothing. So I can just return from the function and that does nothing, right? Otherwise, print the string once, right? Just like we did in the loop body. Um, and then uh, call the function itself. So call print n again, uh, but this time ask uh, print n to print its uh, to print the string n minus one times, right? And so we have here an example where a function calls itself, right? So inside print n, print n is calling itself, right? And so when a function calls itself, we say that the function is a recursive function, right? And yeah, this actually this thing actually works. Right? So if you open up, uh, oh, I didn't. I guess I closed my button. Sorry. So if you open up Python, uh, sorry, I was ready, but I guess I closed everything. Uh, so print n, here we go. Right, so there's print n. Right, I've got some little, uh, underneath the function, I have a little bit of test code, so you can actually run this thing. And so if I run it, um, sorry, where'd it go? There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna print n, uh, I'm gonna use print n to print high, the string high twice, right? And over here you see it prints it twice, right? Uh, if I remove the comment and save, uh, this should print high twice followed by by three times. Um, and yeah, that works, right? And if I remove that comment and save, uh, that should print high twice, buy three times, and then high four times, all in the same line. And that doesn't that seems to work. Okay. So this recursive uh, definition of print n um, seems does in fact seem to work, right? Uh, and I guess there's one more useful test. Uh, let's try to print hello zero times, right? So this should not print hello at all, um, and it doesn't. So this seems, uh, so in our, our small amount of testing, this seems to work okay. And in fact, this um, the way the function is implemented is in fact correct. Okay, so a function that calls itself is called a recursive function, right? Uh, and a recursive function, uh, the, the one of the key um, hallmarks of a recursive function is that a recursive function solves a problem by repeatedly reducing the problem uh, to a smaller version of the problem, right? Uh, and it does so continuously until what something called the base case is reached, right? And so uh, the print n uh, function reduces the problem of printing the star five times, right? To a version of the problem where it prints the star four times, right? And then that one reduces the problem, right? So now print n star four times, that reduces um, the problem to a version of the problem where you have to print it three times, right? And that one reduces the problem to where it has to print twice, and then once, right? and then we hit zero, right? And zero is a base case, right? So if you remember in back in the implementation of the function, if n is less than one, we do nothing, right? So we return. Um, and so that's called a base case where you don't call the function uh, where you don't make a recursive call of the function again, right? And you can see each time, right? It prints out a star and then calls itself again, right? So after doing that five times, you get five stars, which is exactly what you wanted. 
right? So notice the number of times the string is printed decreases uh, after each recursive call to print. Uh, sorry, that should be print n, right? So in other words, this number five, four, three, two, one, zero, that constantly uh, goes down, right? And so in this version of the problem, uh, so for this particular problem, print n, uh, we say the size of the problem that print n is trying to solve is just the value n, right? Every recursive call solves a smaller version of the problem. So n go, has to go down each time, right? And that's the other hallmark of a recursive problem, right? Um, the, a, of a recursive function, right? Every time the function calls itself, it calls itself with a smaller version of the problem. Uh, because it calls itself with a smaller version of the problem, eventually you reach a base case, right? And when you reach the base case, uh, you know the answer, right? So the base case is um, a, is uh, the base case is a version of the problem where you know the answer to the problem, right? So I know what to do for in print n when n is less than one, right? I do nothing, right? If you constantly decrease the size of the problem with each recursive call, eventually you hit a base case. And when you hit the base case, the function finishes. Okay, so the base case occurs when you know the answer to the problem that the function is trying to solve, right? And so um, if you think about print n, right, you know the answer for any value of n, right? Uh, so if n is one, I know I have to print it once. If n is two, I know I have to print it twice. Right? If n is three, I know you have to print it three times. Um, so in principle, you could write your function using um, all of those base cases if you wanted to, right? So you could have a big if else if statement here, right? If n is zero, do nothing. If n is one, print it once. If n is two, print it twice, which I'm doing here, right? If n is three, print it three times and so on and so on and so on, right? Uh, typically, we don't do that in a recursive function. Uh, typically, you try to um, use a base case that represents the smallest version of the problem uh, that you might be interested in solving. So here, right, print n2, um, I'm using a base case where n equals 2, right? And if you take that out for a spin, so let's see what happens when we um, print n2, right? So here's uh, print n2, I'm going to try it out, right? Uh, so this one should print high twice, and it does. This should print high twice and buy three times. And it does. Now, high twice, buy three times, high four times. Um, yeah, that seems to work. Blind, blind. Uh, and now I'm going to call print n2 with one, right? When n equals one. And so when I do that, um, I get the following. Oh, so now it's printing out high. It looks like it's going to print out high continuously. Right, and in fact, uh, this will print high continuously until I run out of memory. Uh, so if you, oh, actually this one has a, that's good, right? Um, and so I've actually run out of one type of memory right here, right? So I haven't actually run out of system memory because I have like 16 gigabytes of RAM on this thing. Um, I've run out of a different type of memory that I'll explain in a second, right? Uh, so what happened here is it seems to have, uh, it seems to be constantly printing out high. Right? In other words, it never seems to reach a base case. Um, and that's because of the way that the function is implemented. Right? So if n is 2, it prints out twice and then stops. Right? Um, otherwise, it prints out something and then calls itself again. Right? So if I start out at 1, um, it prints out something and then calls itself with 0. Right? So the next time you call the function, Zero is not one of the base cases, right? I only have one base case here, and that's what n equals two. So I fall into the recursive case again. So it prints out something, and then it calls itself with minus one, right? So I'll call the function again. Minus one's not a base case, so it comes down to here, prints out something, right? And then calls itself with minus two, and so on, and so on, and so on, right? So uh, this version of print n uh, works uh, as long as you don't pass in a value of n uh, less than two. Right? So in other words, this is missing some base cases. And when you miss a base case, you end up with a recursive function that behaves like this. Right? It never stops until you run out of memory or some other system resource. 
Uh, and you can make that more obvious by, oh, so you fix it by making, uh, by adding the correct base case. Oh, here I put in two, right? So your base cases have to be exhausted, right? So this function is fine as long as you don't pass in the value of n less than two, right? It misses the base case, it misses the cases where n is one or zero or negative, right? Uh, so you can include as many base cases as you like. So here I have two. Uh, but you have to be you have to make sure that your base cases are exhausted, right? They have to cover every situation where the function can return a solution, right? So here I cover the case where n is less than one. Here I cover the case where n is one, and then here I cover every other case, right? So this is fine too, um, but the first version of printn I showed you is simpler, right, with a single base case. Um, but this is also fine. If your base case is missing or never reached, so you have a base case, but you might have the wrong base case, uh, it might never it might never be reached, uh, then the recursive function will run forever, right? So here I have print forever, which has no base case, right? It simply prints out the string and then calls itself again, right? And so if you run this one, uh, which we can do right here, right? No base case. I'm just going to call the function once. Uh, you're going to get the same thing, right? It's just going to keep on printing out high, and eventually it's going to, it eventually it should stop. I think. This one is going to stop. Yeah, there it goes, right? And so eventually uh, you run out of, um, eventually this is basically running out of memory. That's a very funny error message, by the way. Um, OK. So you have to make sure that when you're uh, when you're writing a recursive function, uh, that you have to make sure you have a reachable base case. Okay. Now, how actually, what is actually happening uh, when you write a recursive function? So you, this is this part is actually very important in this um, in this lecture. Uh, so when you're thinking about recursion, um, or when you're trying to reason out why recursion works or how it works. Uh, what I'm about to talk to you is pretty important. OK, so what we need to know, basically to answer this question is, so what happens during recursion is you need to know what happens uh, when a programming language like Python calls a function. Right? So um, I'm not going to tell you exactly what happens, uh, because I actually don't know exactly what happens when Python calls a function. Um, but we can use a simplified model of what happens when Python calls a function. Right. So a simple model of what happens is that uh, every time you call a function, a version of that function runs in its own uh, new, right? So new is important here, new block of memory, right? So when I call printn, some chunk of memory gets isolated where printn can run. If printn calls itself, then a new chunk of memory gets allocated for the second version of printn. If that version calls printn, then a third chunk of memory gets allocated for the third version of printn to run, right? And they're all independent of one another, right? So when one's running, uh, so yeah, so when the third version runs, it does not affect the second version. Uh, so consider what happens in the printn function, right? So here's printn again, right? I'm just showing you quickly, right? So we got a base case. Uh, if you don't, if you're not in a base case, we print s once, and then you print it. Uh, you use print n uh, to call to print s n minus one more time. So I'm going to call print n uh, star uh, with a two, right? And so when I call that function, I get some chunk of memory over here, right? That's what this block of memory over here, this thing over here is, right? Uh, so I get some chunk of memory over here uh, where print n gets to run. Right. The function printn has a parameter s and it has a parameter n. Right. So when you call the function, um, the parameter s gets set to um, this. Uh, we're calling it with the star. Right. So that's a remember in Python, everything's a reference. Right. So I'm passing a reference to a string uh, equal to the star. Right. And so s just gets set to that reference. Right. And I'm using the number two. So n gets set to uh, the integer, uh, well, it gets set to a reference to some integer number two, right? 
uh, if you don't like this reference thing, it's not it's not so important here. You can just think of this S as being a star and N being a two, uh, and that would be sufficient um, for uh, today's lecture. Uh, this part of memory where print n is running is called a stack frame. Functions occupy a space in, uh, in a region of memory called the stack, right? So there's some chunk of, uh, there's some special part of memory called the stack, right? Every time a function runs, it gets some piece of that memory and it's called a stack frame, right? The information in the stack frame includes uh, the parameters of the function. If the function makes any local variables, then there is there's space here for the local variables as well. Um, and if you ever get around to taking the compilers course in fourth year, uh, you'll learn all about these things, like exactly what goes into one of these things. Right? There's a bunch of other stuff. Right? So there's uh, where the return value of the function should be copied to, where control flow should go after the function completes, and a bunch of other stuff that's not important to us right now. Uh, stack memory is special. Right, so it's not the regular memory you have um, on your computer. It's a uh, special, right? So it's a special part of that memory. Uh, it can be allocated and deallocated very quickly, right? So in other words, uh, the um, Python can grab a, ch a chunk of the stack very quickly, and it can release a chunk of the stack very quickly. Right? Uh, now that speed is obtained by restricting the total amount of stack memory. Right? So there's a limited amount of stack space, right? uh, which is why when I ran that recursive function that kept on going forever, um, uh, you eventually got a, um, an error message saying that it's uh, you've re you, uh, there's too many levels of recursion, right? Um, it's trying to tell you that it's run out of stack memory, right? So every time you call, every time printn calls itself, I need a new stack frame for the new version of printn, right? And then when it calls itself, I need a third one. And when it calls itself, I need a fourth one, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Right? So you eventually exceed the amount of stack memory, which causes the program to crash. Uh, and so that's what's happening uh, when the recursive function runs forever. Now, if it doesn't run forever, well, I guess when it runs, right? So what happens when print n2 runs, right? So I get a stack frame and then uh, whatever happens um, in the print n uh, function happens, right? So two is not a base case. Uh, that, so the function falls into the recursive case. In the recursive case, it prints S once, and then it calls itself, right? So what happens when it calls itself? Well, another chunk of the stack gets allocated, right? And a second version of the printn function runs, right? So a different instance of the printn function runs, and it has its own independent parameters S and N, right? So it gets its own... Uh, it gets its own copy of S and N, right? Notice that N is now one, right? Because this, right, that call uh, to print N, uh, use the value one. So it's gonna print S one time, right? So this one starts to run. And now what happens? Well, at one is not the base case, right? So the function prints S once and then calls itself. Right, this time passing in zero, right? So what happens? Well, another version of printn appears on the stack, right? It's got its own copy of S and N, right? Now N is zero, um, and so what happens now? Well, zero is a base case, so the function does nothing, right? It simply returns, right? When a function returns, the space allocated to it on the stack disappears. Right, so it goes away, right? When the third function returns, this one's done, right? The second one's now done as well, right? Because print n uh, is the last line of the recursive function, right? So now the second version of print n is finished. So it returns, right? When this returns, its stack space, oops, sorry, gets deallocated, right? And now, oh, there's something missing here. Uh, and now the first version of printn is finished running, right? Because the call, the recursive call to printn was the last thing in the function. So this one can now return. And now your program starts, uh, continues running here. 
Right, so quickly, what's happened? Right, I call printn here. Printn, uh, uh, so uh, space, space gets allocated on the stack for the first version of printn to run. Right, not a base case, so prints s and calls itself. Right, new version of printn appears. One's not a base case, so it prints s, calls itself. New version of printn appears. Right, zero is a base case, so the function returns and disappears, right? Now the second version is done, so it disappears. The third version is done, or the original version, sorry, is done, and it disappears, and now your program continues running here, right? So this location is one of the things that's stored in the stack frame, right? So it needs to know where to jump back to to continue running. And so that's that location there. So that's also stored um, as part of your stack frame. Uh, and so that's what happens when you call a recursive uh, function, right? So one of the questions a lot of students have, so the way a lot of students reason about a function, a recursive function, is that they think it's the same function every time, right? And so if they think if they modify something in the function, uh, the function, the recursive call should see the modification. That's not true, right? It's not true because it's a separate version of the function that runs. Uh, when you recursively call, when the function recursively calls itself, right? So you need to keep this picture in mind, right? Every time the function runs, every time the function calls itself, it's a new version of the function that's running. It's not the uh, previous version of the function that's running, right? Only when the uh, recursively called function finishes running does the previous version of the function continue to run. Okay. Uh, and so um, that's what happens uh, when you run a recursive method, uh, function, sorry, recursive function. Uh, does anybody have any questions about um, what I just uh, talked about? Or about, yeah, so about what happens when you uh, call a recursive function? Uh, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not oh. there's a bit of an echo. I'm not sure if that's on my end or if you're hearing that as well. No, I'm fine. Okay, I got like a really strong echo of my own voice. Um, okay, it ended. Uh, so my question is not so much about the the flow of the program uh, using recursion, uh, but just curious to know if this has implications in buffer overflows. Uh, probably not, unless the buffer, unless however, however you're accessing the buffer is also recursive. I see. Okay. And uh, there's no way to know that. Any other questions? Anybody? Okay. Oh, wait. how will these recursive functions be applied in our set checkers? Will they just be a part of questions? How will these be applied in our assignment checkers as well? Um, the next assignment that you get on Friday is going to be all recursion. So <laughs> hopefully that answers your question. Uh, so, uh, so what I didn't talk about today um, is uh, when exactly. Um, so, okay, so the example of printing something n times is not a great example of recursion of when to use recursion, right? Because you could solve this problem just as easily using a loop, and you don't have to worry about the stack um, about this about blowing up your stack or anything like that, right? Uh, but there are a lot of problems in computing um, where the solution um, is almost trivially expressed using recursion, uh, but is extraordinarily hard to write using um, using the loops. Uh, and so those are the sorts of problems uh, that we're interested in studying. Um, the problem with those kinds of problems are it's um, uh, if if you don't look at the if you don't study the the simpler versions of recursion first, um, the harder versions, well, the more interesting versions don't make sense either. Um, and so we normally start out with these little examples where um, you wouldn't normally use recursion, um, but it's important that you study them so that you understand what's going on in recursion. Right? Uh, you'll see next week probably uh, where there are what seem to be really simple problems um, that are extraordinarily hard to solve if you try to use a loop. Uh, but if you just write the uh, solution recursively, 
um, the solution pops out in a few lines of code. Uh, I have a question for Simon too. Is it okay if uh, I call a function within a function? Yes, of course. That's exactly why we write functions, right? The whole purpose of writing a function is to have something, some chunk of code that's reusable, right? And so for assignment two, um, you absolutely want to call neighborhood from evolve, right? Um, and if you look at my solution, well, that's that's not necessarily true. Um, so if you look at the solution I have, um, evolve calls two other functions. Those two other functions call neighborhood. Right, so I do it uh, in a way that's different than the way I've seen most students do it, um, which is fine. I mean, the way most students are doing it is just fine. Uh, but you should absolutely uh, that that is the that is the the that absolutely is the purpose of writing a function is so that other people, including or so other callers, including other functions, can call the function. What chapters are covered in our quiz next week? Uh, you only need to know it's basically up to functions, so there's no recursion or anything. But uh, I'll, I'll I'll put a, a uh, I'll put an uh, announcement on um, on Q. But yeah, it's it's um, it's anything after the first quiz, um, up to and including functions. Right, no recursion. Okay, any other questions? Why do the stacks disappear after all the iteration complete? Uh, rather than uh, after they run for the first time. Okay, so that's a good question. Okay, so when you call print n uh, the first time, right? So what happens, right? So we get a stack frame. Oops, sorry, we get a stack frame, right? Uh, S gets set and gets set. And now whatever code is in the function starts to run, right? So is n less than one? No, right? So we fall into the else part, right? So print uh, s uh, so we print s once uh, and then the function calls itself right however this function can't go away right the, the original function can't go away until this one finishes right so this one has to finish because there could be something on the next line sorry Ugh. right something here right so remember when you call a function in python right uh control jumps from this point to the function right so control flow flows from here to here right and so this one can't go away until this one finishes right now this one starts to run and it calls another function right it can't go away until this one goes away Right now, this one's done, so it can go away. Now this one's done, so it can go away. Now that one's done, so it can go away. Yeah, so that's a, that's a that's a really good question, Jacob. Okay, any other questions? Mm, all right, that's great. Um, uh, that's all that I have for today's talk. Um, uh, I guess we're done for the day. Okay, so if no one's got any questions, I'm out of here. We're good? Okay, that's it, we're done, thanks.